Hey guys, thanks so much for finding me here to learn all about IO Planner and how to set up your account. If you are a member of Planning Collective, I'm gonna go through all of the specifics that you're gonna find in your account, learn how to set it up, and then learn how we're gonna use it within the membership. If you have found this video and you are not a member, please make sure to check out planningcollective.com to learn all about the membership benefits and how we can help you avoid the wedding planning overwhelm. IO Planner is a huge part of that, and so we're gonna dig into all the features here. So I'm gonna do a big long video here, but also break it down into the different sections. So please make sure to reference the other videos. So if you're looking for help just with your guest list or budget, you can skip right to that video and avoid the whole run through. Um, but if you are just setting things up, watch the long video that will take you through each one of the steps so that you know uh, all of the features and you're not missing anything. So let's dig into it. Okay, so once you've joined Planning Collective, you're gonna receive an email that will prompt you on how to join and log into your IELTS Planner account. Once you've done that, this is gonna be the dashboard that you see each time you log into your account. So in order to show you all of the features, I set up a fake account here for Pam and Jim, and we're gonna go through how to set up the account in this back end. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is review this dashboard. This is gonna be the home page that shows you kind of an overview of your planning so you can see where you're at. Over here in the important items, this is where it will fill with any tasks that are due, payments that might be due, or things that you need to accomplish. We're gonna get into each one of these sections here in a little bit, but this is kind of like your home page where you're gonna be able to access everything within IO Planner. Let's start up in the settings. So if you go up here, this is where you're gonna be able to change any of your main details. So if for some reason your account was set up with a wrong name or you wanna change any of these details, you can go ahead and do that here. You can see you can change titles. Um, so please do make sure again, if for some reason your account was not set up properly, you can come in and change this here. You can add a photo of the two of you, always a good thing so you can see that up here and it will be associated with your account. You can update the, the date, the city, the uh, default for the guest count is gonna be 150, so you can update that here, and then of course any of the other um, details, you can also change those. The notifications are up here, so if you want to adjust how you're receiving updates via the app, uh, pop-up notification or email, this is where you can also adjust that. If you would like to add access to a, another person, so let's say your fiance, your maid of honor, your mom, if you wanna give somebody else access to your account, right now you'll have to let me know. So you can send me an email with their full name and their email address, and I will go ahead and add them in as a planning partner. Now please do also make sure I know how much access you want me to give them. They can be set up to view everything, or they can be set up to update everything. So if, for example, you want your fiance to be able to have the full access, update the budget, contacts, all of that, then let me know that. But if you want your mom to just be able to view your vendors or the timeline, you don't want them in on the budget details, then specify those details there and I will go ahead and add them in. So we're gonna move on to the checklist feature. This is one of the most important things that I think couples will get out of IO Planner. This is where it's gonna help you keep up to date on your tasks and you can see a lot of the tasks that you maybe haven't thought about yet are gonna be in here and auto-filled. Now that being said, you're also gonna see that there are some things that are not gonna to pertain to your wedding. So you can view this in a couple of different ways. The full checklist is here, or if you wanna take a look at how things are broken down, you can do the assignment overview. Now, as of right now, the bride does not have anything assigned, so let's go through how you can make that happen. So if we go back to the full checklist, and we're gonna to go to getting started. Now, 
if you were in a task, actually, let's go to a different one because this is not a good example. I'm going to check off a couple of these things. They'll come into play later, but we can check those off and that shows you that it's been completed. Now, if we're going into the guest list, let's talk about this. So when you click on the item, you're going to see that more details open up below it. This is where you can add certain things. So if there's something you wanna make a note to, you can add that in here. Here is where you would be able to assign this task to somebody. So let's say you have invited your fiance and you need to have them input their side of the guest list. You can add them. Now, obviously, there's only the two people in the account right now, but if your fiance was added as a planning partner, then they would show up here and you can assign that task to them. You can also assign it, of course, to yourself. I would highly recommend you don't assign anything to me <laughs> because uh, I will not be going through and um, taking care of any of these items. Um, so you can go through and add people that you, you need to add. Now, the reason why you would wanna make sure to put yourself in here is because now if we come over here, you're going to see that these are the things that have been assigned to you. And then if you go back to your dashboard, you're going to see that they've also been added over here. So that's why it's important for you to add yourself into these tasks if you want them to pop up as a notification. That's how you're going to go ahead and take care of that. If there is something let's say you don't necessarily need a reminder about inviting people to collaborate to this account, or if there's something that you just wanna keep in this checklist but not necessarily have pop up as a notification, you don't need to add yourself to that. Now I do also want to point out when you click on the item and you head over to the right, this is gonna be where you can change the due date. So all of these dates are auto-filled based on the average one year engagement and when tasks would typically be done. So because right now recording this in May with a wedding that is over a year and a half away, it's gonna look like there aren't any tasks that are due until this December. But if you really have a year and a half engagement, that doesn't mean that you're not gonna do anything. Uh, you can update a lot of these items here. So let's say you wanna work on your guest list and get that done sooner rather than later. You can change that to say, okay, by June 1st, we wanna have our guest list done and you can update that there. As you get into the finer, uh, detailed items, having this checklist will be really helpful because you can see, okay, so a couple of weeks before the wedding is when we need to finalize our seating plan. So that's why it's going to be helpful that those are auto-populated in there. It's just a guide for you to know when things are typically done. Now, let's say that you have a much shorter engagement than the average one year. You, when you're first logging into your account, I don't want you to panic because you're going to see a lot of these items are red. And that, again, is just because this software is programmed to autofill for a one year engagement. So if that is the case, if let's say you have a six month engagement, or maybe you're just finding the software with six months left, you're gonna see a bunch of red here and that's okay. What I want you to pay attention to is the due date and try and tackle or take care of the items in the order that they're listed first. So in order to do that, we're gonna see in this um, in the checklist feature, right now we're looking at it by category. So getting started, then you're going to see all the tasks that have to do with the guest list here. Then the budget tasks tasks are down here, wedding planning tasks, so um, and so so forth there. If you come up to view options, you can have it sorted by date. So then when you come over here, you're gonna see now that they're all sorted by when things are due. I just changed that one date to June 1st, so that's popping up here first. Then everything else is going to be in order. So this tells you 
when you should be working on tasks or rather what the priority of your tasks should be. So again, if you hop in here and you see that everything is red, don't worry because I'm sure you probably have a lot of these things already done and I can tell you it feels really good. So let's say you have all of these things booked, even though that you're, if they're red, we're checking things off left and right here. Now we're gonna head over here and see that that's gonna update our tasks that are due and also the planning progress. Now, side note, I'm gonna say don't get too focused on this planning process wheel. I know it does feel good to go from 0% to five and, and to see the progress that you are making. But as we go over to this checklist again, we're gonna head back over here, look at the full checklist by due date. We're gonna come down as it gets closer to the wedding. There are gonna be some things in here that are set for after your wedding and some things that are going to be uh, little things that you can't really do until right before the wedding. All of these items are also impacting that progress wheel. So even on your wedding day, because there are these items that are after the fact, you're not gonna be at 100%. So just putting that little warning out there, I know I've had couples in the past that get obsessed <laughs> as it gets closer. Why aren't we at 100% yet? I feel like we're missing something. That's the reason why, because enjoying your rehearsal dinner here that you see, that's technically an item. So with that in mind, if you don't want this impacting your lists, if you just kind of want to get rid of some of the items that you don't really need to have in there, you can do that by hovering over here. You're going to see the plus and the trash can. You would just simply hit that trash can. It's going to make sure that you are uh, confirming that you want to delete that item and you can delete it there and then that is gone. So the same thing, you're probably going to want to go through and make sure, uh, for example, if you don't need transportation to the airport. Obviously, you don't need this reminder. We're going to get rid of that one there. There's a few notifications for destination weddings or if it's an outdoor ceremony. Um, there are a couple of things in here. Obviously, if, if we have two brides, if we have two grooms, if there's no bridesmaids or no groomsmen, there are going to be things that you'll need to customize based on your wedding and just feel free to go ahead and do that. Now you can also, whoops, I meant to change it by category. On that note, if let's say you aren't going to have an engagement party, um, you can delete a whole category. But what I want to make sure you know is that this is going to delete all of the items throughout the planning software. So for an engagement party, probably not that big of a deal to delete it. But if you want to delete, let's say, the items um, for where I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find our cinema. Um, okay, so let's say you want to delete this here because you have a um, a friend that is doing your videography. If you delete this here because you're done with this, that's also going to delete over in the budget. It's going to delete from the contacts. It's going to delete from all other areas within the system. So I highly recommend you don't delete categories unless it is something like, again, we have a bride's checklist. Well, if we have two grooms, we don't need a bride's checklist. So that's different. But otherwise, I would just say delete the tasks individually or check them off and then leave the categories as they are. Okay, one last thing to point out in the checklist is as you're looking at the individual items, you're gonna see some of them have a little note icon that is right here. If you click on that, you're gonna see that I have already put in some details here in this section that are either gonna help you with setting up your account or in some cases, it's gonna be tips that you can use for planning. So here, it's just a reminder of how to access the planning partners so you can add people into the wedding. As we're talking about the guest list, here's the same kind of update. 
But as you get into your planning a little bit more, you're going to see some things that pop up that will either tell you what bundles within Planning Collective will help you with each of the features or just a little quick tip that will help you with whatever that note is. So as I'm kind of scrolling through here, um, you see the main task item, finalize, order, or print stationary items. Um, my note here is to hold off on printing the seating chart or the place cards until the week of the wedding because there's always last minute changes. So that's just an example of some of the little things that you'll find kind of hidden, hidden in there. So next to the view options, you're also going to see a little share button. If you wanted to download or print pretty much anything in any of these categories, this is where you're going to find that. So as we get into the notes and the timeline and all of that, if you hover over here, you're going to see you can download it as a PDF. You can select a couple of different options here, and then that's where you can either access it outside of the software here, or you can use the PDF to print it if you wanna have a physical copy to bring along with you to any meetings. Again, you'll find that in the checklist feature and also most of these other features will have this same option. So once you've gone through and customized your checklist uh, to reflect what your details are going to be for your wedding day, we can head over to the calendar. And here you're gonna see is where things are auto-filled in from our checklist. So again, because this wedding has a particularly long engagement, we don't have anything that's popping up except for that June item that we did modify and move over here. So if seeing things visually in a calendar like this is more beneficial for you, I think this feature will be really helpful. Now you can jump because we know we've got a lot of things that are due starting in December for this particular event. We're gonna jump over to December and obviously, because this is that first day that is 365 days away from the wedding, you're going to see a whole bunch of tasks that pop up here. You can then look and see what is coming up that's due in future months. So the next date that has a, a huge amount of tasks that are due is going to be on uh, March 6th. Now, keep in mind, again, the software auto populates, so not everything needs to be done at this time. I know that feels overwhelming to see like nothing in February and then all of a sudden a ton of things on one date. So make sure to go through and specify what you need to do when. There's quite a few tasks that aren't going to pertain to every single couple, and some of these are basic account setup details. Um, but also just make sure that you're kind of clearing it out and uh, spreading things out a little bit. You can also change the view uh, here with different details so you aren't seeing necessarily everything. If you don't want to see um, payments here or timelines, you can select those. So this feature, um, again, some couples really like this better than the other view of the checklist and some will rarely look at the calendar. It just kind of depends on how you prefer to look at different features. Okay, now we're gonna head over to the timeline feature. And to be honest, this is probably the feature I use the most, especially in the weeks and months before the wedding. You will probably not get too involved in this until it gets closer, um, but I wanna kind of explain because this can be a confusing feature if you are not familiar with it. So you're gonna at first see that there is a, it's basically a template that I'm including in the account that basically will list all of the common tasks that most couples will see happen on the wedding day. In the notes section, as well as in one of the bundles in the membership over on Planning Collective, you're gonna see a bunch of samples of timelines that we have for actual wedding days, and they are gonna be listed by um, the different main components like ceremony and reception in one place, um, ceremony and reception, you know, with a several hour gap, Jewish services, Catholic services, um, first look, no first look, all of those little details. So those will help give you an idea 
of some of the different things, but I want to show you this template and see, so you can see how this will help you because what's going to be here is going to have the most information for you guys as you're putting together your timeline. So it starts off this, this uh, first day is going to be probably a couple of days before your actual ceremony. And this is really just set as a reminder for you to follow the YouTube link that will talk about putting together the sample um, uh, timeline so you can put it together specifically for you guys. Once you've done this and you've set it up, if you delete this task, it's going to delete that day. You can also add another day. And so let's say you have multiple days of celebrations or family in town, or you just want to start your timeline several days before the wedding. That's where you can add that in and add in the item. Now, each of these items as we're going through will have a little tip or something for you to keep in mind for each one of these items. What I recommend for most couples is rather than modifying this timeline, you keep this as kind of a structured outline that you can reference back to and start a new timeline up here with your actual details. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll have a new timeline that's added in and we're gonna say Pam and Jim. I can't type today. And then that way you can kind of start from scratch, but you're always able to reference this main timeline here. So right up here is where you're going to be able to find that. So you're going to see, okay, the main timeline to reference these points um, or, or little items will always be here. But this is going to be, whoops, this is going to be where we find our main details. And then you can start with filling those in specifically here. So um, what you're going to see is the time will be here. So let's say it's a 6 p.m. ceremony. And um, that's kind of how you just go from there. If you want to add notes in here or if you want to connect somebody, you can do that here. You can add additional items, as many as you need. And of course, you can delete them here as needed as well. So that's what I would recommend. You use this timeline as an outline and then with using this and the other samples that are included in the notes, you can build out your own timeline rather than modifying the one that is there. The different views, um, the ways that you can, can filter the view, and then just like in the checklist, here's where you can download and print it off or download to email to others that are not connected once you have a more complete timeline. After the timeline here in the menu bar, you're going to see the design studio. Let's go through there and talk a little bit about this process. So this is going to be pretty similar to a Pinterest board, but it's going to be more specific to your wedding with a lot fewer distractions than you're going to find on Pinterest. So this feature is used probably hit or miss by our clients. If you have a go-to system on Pinterest, you might not want to reinvent the wheel and start over from here. But I can tell you that using this design studio, um, it, because it's not Pinterest, it can also be a huge benefit because you can keep things focused and um, there, there aren't the distractions as you'll find over on Pinterest. So you can add style guides here based on the category. So let's say we want to talk about cake for this one and we'll call it cake inspo. And then we can either add images. So if you have saved images from your computer or from Pinterest, you can add those in here or you can browse and add images this way. And again, this is very slight. You can add notes about what you loved about the image. Uh, very similar to the, the Pinterest feature if you are used to that. Let's find some other cakes. We're going to add this one in. And you get the idea. 
So again, if you're familiar with Pinterest, it's going to be very similar. You can sort through the, uh, the inspirational images. And again, you can also add in your own to your design board. Oops, how do we get back over to our timeline? And so then you're going to see as you get to your design studio that the images that we um, pulled or the, the two are going to come over here. And then you're also going to see as you're adding these in, the inspiration on your dashboard will start to fill in. So again, you can use this, this feature as much as you want, as little as you want. You can add color palettes. So if you're looking to create your own color palette, you can pull those colors in from the different things that you are looking at. So it really can be a great tool to use. You can also share it with your different vendors, uh, family members, whatever it might be. You can share it with them here. Um, and again, depending on how involved you already are in Pinterest, it can be either a huge benefit or you might just feel more comfortable with the Pinterest features that you're, you're already familiar with. Next up is our guest feature, and you're gonna see that we have two very important guests that will be in here already. The two of you will be uh, the first of the guests that are added in. And we are going to talk then about how you add in more of your guests to be able to manage your guest feature, and then what are all of the things that you can do within this tool to help manage RSVPs, guest lists, all of those fun details. But before we get into adding the guests, I want you to head over to this event info and options tab. So this is going to pop up and you're going to see that the ceremony and reception is the main thing that is here. And so we're just going to say, we're going to continue with that and put in our date. I guess it probably would have been easier for me to just type it in, huh? Um, whatever your details are, oh, we're not doing 6 a.m. Um, so, so the main event that you're talking about, add that in here. Now down at the bottom, this is an important feature that you're probably going to um, need later on in the, in the early stages. You're not going to know really much about this yet, but here is where you will add in the meal options so you can track them as your RSVPs and everything are coming in. So if you're going to offer beef, chicken, and a fish, we're putting those in there. Um, and then, of course, you can also add vegan, vegetarian, allergies, things like that. You can add those in there as well. So make sure you get that set up or... Just remember, this is where you will do that because, again, this isn't typically on the radar in the first stages of adding in your guest list, but it'll be a huge benefit later on down the road. So note that we're in the ceremony and reception here. If you are having other events like a brunch, rehearsal dinner, maybe an engagement party, and you'd like to also track those details, within this aisle planner tool, you can absolutely do that and it really helps keep everything all together. And this is a reason why you might wanna add in some planning partners. So let's say your, um, your maid of honor is taking charge of the engagement party, but you wanna be able to just send her the, the guest list from this feature, you can add her in and then just send her the engagement party information here. So let's take a look at this same thing, event info and options, you would add in the date location uh, for your brunch, um, if that is something you're going to do. And then you're also going to have the option to add in the meals. Typically, we'll see in a rehearsal dinner or a brunch that it's more of a buffet or something like that. Um, so you can add in the options here if that is a choice that you have. So make sure that you are keeping an eye on which guest list you are looking at. Again, the ceremony and reception is going to be most likely the biggest <laughs> that you're looking at. And then you can update some of the detailed options over in this event info and options. This again is the section that I think people will be on a hunt for <laughs> and it can be easy to forget that that's where those are located. Okay, so let's go ahead and add some 
guests in. Now you can add guests in a couple of different ways. If you already have a guest list going in Excel or another format, you can import the guest list here and they will all autofill and you can just update the details within each guest or you can add them in manually this way. So we're gonna say, let's add my parents in. And let's say that they are bringing their three kids. That's gonna drive me nuts, I have to update that. Um, so we're gonna say the McClellans are coming. We are on Jim's side of the family and we're inviting the McClellans there. Now let's also add in John and Jane, Maybe just so we have a couple of different options. We'll give them five kids. And, um, And they've got one kid with them. We'll put them as Jim's friends here. Okay. So we've added a few guests here. We'll just leave it at this. Obviously, you'll, you'll probably have a few more. <laughs> but um, this way you can kind of see we have a few different options. As we're looking at this main page, we can take a look at whether or not there are kids or others that are invited. You're gonna see there's a formal address. So if you are gonna be sending this list to a calligrapher, you can put their most formal address in here. I don't necessarily recommend having an A list or a B list, but let's say we love to invite the Smiths here, but we need to see where the rest of our count comes in. That's where you can separate this. Now, as we are going into each one of the guests, this is where you can add more detail. So if you know, let's say John and Jane are married, um, you know that they're coming together, then you know this makes sense. But let's say that maybe we're inviting somebody with a plus one, but we don't know who they are yet. We don't know what their date's name is. That's where that comes into play. Now we can add each one of the kids if they are participating in the wedding. Here's where we can update that. Let's say we decided the two youngest are not coming. We can delete those there. Or let's say we at first invited them and we need to add. That's where we can do that. I would highly recommend also entering your guest contact information here. It'll help you to keep track of everything and keep it all in one place. You can also add in phone and email in case for some reason you need to update the guests on any changes or last minute transportation updates, anything like that. And then I want you to note here too that there is an RSVP number that's associated and it's also listed over here. And if you've gone through our stationary bundle, you'll know what that's all about, but make sure that you're using this number on the back of your RSVP cards. So if John decides to mail back his RSVP card saying, I'm so excited to come, me and the wife and all three kids are coming, or you know, just I'm coming, but he doesn't put the name on it, you know because it says 103, you can come back to the system and say, okay, who, who got RSVP card 103, and you know who that RSVP came from. So again, more on that in the stationary bundle. Check that out when it's time to start looking at those details. So this is where you can fill everything in for your guests. And again, you'll see that information filters in over here. Very blank because we did not <laughs> put any of that information there, but that's where you're gonna see all of that is filled in. So let's, whoops. Scrolled too much. Let's head over to this RSVP summary, and this is where you can invite guests to different events. So again, the main event is going to be the ceremony and the reception. So this is where you're gonna add in, assuming that all guests are gonna be invited to all events, you would add these in here. We can't, add, well, now we can, but you first saw that, um, Rob and Maria here were grayed out. And that's because remember we had them on the wait list. So, or they were on list B. So you can undo that 
now they would not be invited to this event if you see it grayed in a little bit. If they're not able to come or they've declined, that's what that symbol is. So this is going to show you who's coming to what event. And again, same over here in the brunch when you click on it and it is not grayed out. So you're going to see that it is white. That means that they've been invited. Then you would check to say they are coming or if they decline, click again and then it will say decline. So I kind of I kind of flew through that. Let's um, so Pam obviously asked the bride is going to be invited to everything. So if it's grayed out, that means that she's not invited. We click on it again. She is invited. Click on it one last time. That means she is attending. Um, if a guest cannot attend, you click on it that last time and it will do the decline there. Now, whoops, sorry, I'm just trying to confuse everyone here. Now, same thing goes for the brunch. As we're looking through here, this is indicating that John is not invited to the rehearsal dinner and he's not able to attend the brunch. But if we click on that, that opens it up that he's invited to the rehearsal dinner now he's attending, click again, now he has to decline. So this is where you're going to be able to track all of the different events and see at a glance who's able to attend and who is not. The meal selection is gonna carry over here. So as we get closer to the event, if Pam selected the chicken, John selected the fish, and maybe let's say the little ones are so little they don't need a meal, that's where you would indicate that there. And so you can keep track of it for each of the events that you gave an option for the meal. This is where you would track that. If you are collecting RSVPs online or if you have a website where it's connected to your guest list, you'll see this guest message feature. Um, you can send messages to the guests if you have included their email in their uh, information. And again, some couples really like this feature and some find it easier to communicate in ways that they've already been familiar with. So it really just depends on um, um, what you find easiest. But this is where you're going to see the, um, the information from the online RSVP if you are using that feature. And at last, of course, you're going to see, uh, just like the other um, tools, you can change the view over here. So you can see this, we've been grouping everybody, the individual, or I'm sorry, the, the groupings by the parties or families. But if you list individuals, you're going to see each individual person, which basically takes you over to that, uh, that same view. You can sort by all of these different things. And let's say you don't want that horizontal scroll to be so long. You want to take out different things. You know you don't need height chairs or wheelchairs. Um, you're not listing people's roles. You can take out some of these items and then it will condense it here. So it's not quite so much information. So if you like seeing all of it, great. You can include it all, but if you'd rather narrow it down, you can definitely do that too. And then of course the download, uh, so you can print off or email this to somebody else if you would like, this is where you would do that. The next feature up is the layout and seating feature that IO Planner offers. And this is another one that might be considered optional depending on what your venue is able to provide for you. So you're probably not gonna get into this too deeply until closer to the wedding, but let's review it now. Most venues are going to have a layout or floor plan that they will provide you. But if your venue does not do this for you, or maybe your wedding is at your home or a private residence, you're really going to be able to take advantage of this tool. It is going to be your new best friend. <laughs> so um, if you don't have a floor plan from your venue, let's get into it. If you do, you are going to start with simple seating. So if your venue provides you a floor plan, this is the tool you're still gonna want to use. If you need to create a floor plan, we're gonna start right here. So this is gonna be a quick review of this feature. We'll do a deep dive in another video because it's not a feature that everyone is going to use. But basically what you do is you create your own layout. You create your own venue. So you can pick which 
which event <laughs> you're going to create a layout for. Most commonly, of course, is going to be reception, then ceremony. But if you have different events or if you need a layout for cocktail hour or maybe the brunch or rehearsal dinner, you can also add those in here with a new layout. But we're going to start with the feature. We're going to draw a rectangle here. I'm going to pretend like we are creating a very basic layout here for a backyard wedding. You can adjust sizing and all of the details over here. Okay, so let's pretend this is our backyard. To make that a little bit easier, let's... Oops, we're in the line, not the fill. That's why that's not happening. Okay, there we go. We got some grass here. Um, so this is our backyard. Now we're going to add in our tent. So same thing, we can hop over here in the shape. So if we have, let's say, 80 by 40 tent, that's a pretty standard but big size tent <laughs> that's taking up a good portion of the yard. I would not recommend if this is all the yard we have, we shouldn't fill it this this full with our tent. But for an example, this will work as is. So you can change the colors. You can obviously add in a whole bunch of details, make it as detailed or simple as you would like. Um, but this gives you the basic outline of the tent. Um, and so we are going to want to add in the details uh, to fill out the reception. We can do that here with the library. I will say most commonly we're going to see 72 inch rounds and a 60 inch round is the next common. So let's plug in a couple of those here. Um, we'll add in if this is our cocktail area, we've got some high tops with seating here. And you can add in, so serpentines would normally be for like, um, if we're making a sweetheart table or maybe a um, buffet, that's not quite one long table. But here you can see as we're scrolling through in this bottom right, this is where all of the different um, items are going to be laid out. So you can add in if you've got a lounge area, I'm gonna keep it really simple. Um, again, we'll we'll go through this in more detail in another video, but just for, for these purposes, we got a couple of tables. Let's show you how you can then incorporate these with your seating chart. Okay, so let's pretend like we have all of our tables <laughs> lined up for, for where things are going to go, at least a general idea. We can head over here to our seating and if you have a layout from your venue, this is the screen that you're going to go to in that simple seating layout or feature. So here's where you're going to see our reception guests that are pulled over from our guest tool feature over here. You're going to see all of the ones that have confirmed that they are joining us and the reception are going to be over here. Of course, our bride and our groom, let's get things started. We'll make a sweetheart table for these two. So we're gonna have just two people at this sweetheart table. We're gonna call it number three, but we'll talk about the layout or the table numbers in just a minute. Um, we have, because we put in a 72 inch table and we put in a 60 inch table, that's why these are auto populated with 10 and eight in these two categories. Then we also had our, um, uh, they called it a, a high boy, but this table over here, which normally, I put these over here as like a cocktail table, but obviously it, it filled in because we have seats there. So we're gonna head over to the seating and this is where you're gonna see if we're gonna put all of, let's say Mike, Diane, and their guests are gonna come over to this table. You're gonna basically be able to do your seating chart from your guest list and then be able to see how that is happening over here in your layout. So where we put those guests just now, you'll see those dots that are on this space right here. You can definitely change the view and the what you're able to see um, within these different features. So you can change it around, play with it a little bit as we select this table if you wanna see the numbers. 
show the seat number. So if you're assigning each individual seat, that would be beneficial. If you want to see the guest names, you can also do that. G of Mike M, guest of Mike M. And you can also show the meals that pop up down here as a color um, coded indicator. Um, so they're not popping up here because we didn't fill in the meals there, but you're gonna see Pam over here. We had assigned her the chicken. So her indicator turned a different color there. So that's where you can track all of these things. Or of course, if you wanna keep it nice and clean, you can also do that. So this is a great feature if you do not have a venue that can provide a layout for you. Again, if your venue does have a layout or a floor plan, I don't recommend that you mess around too much with this just because, as you can see, it is going to be a time-consuming task and you're never going to be able to get it to be better than what the venue already has within their in-house system. So again, I don't recommend it if your venue has a system already in place. You can simply use this seating to be able to assign guests in an easier way without reinventing the wheel since you already have them in your guest tool feature. But if you don't have the layout, this is an, an amazing tool for you guys to have. It's going to save you um, a lot of stress <laughs> and probably a lot of paper that you'd be scribbling with your diagrams on. So that is the layout and seating feature. Next up, we're heading over to the contacts, and this is where you're going to be able to keep track of all of your vendor details. So let's go ahead and start adding some vendors in. So I'm going to put my own company in here if I can spell it right. And we're the wedding planners. And so you can just add them in here. Obviously, there's another add in up here. Um, you can indicate if a vendor is already booked or maybe it is somebody you're just talking to and considering. So if you are considering them, uh, it's going to come up here as gray. If you're considering them and they haven't been booked, you're probably not going to fill out too much of this information, but it is a place where you can keep track of different vendors. Um, and so whatever works best for you, if you want to hold off on putting them in here until they are booked, that's absolutely fine too. So once you've booked them, you would just select that there. This note section, you can add any details that you want, um, maybe who you're, um, who you met with, the day that you met, any details that you talked about that you want to make sure to keep in mind. Of course, the contact information you fill in here, address, phone, email, website. If there is, so if it's a company that has multiple contacts, so your venue, maybe you have a um, a salesperson that you're in touch with, but there's also a person that is the one you're talking to about event specifics, you can add in multiple point people here. And then this is where you would add in any payment notes. If your vendor is going to need a meal or a seat at the reception, you would also add that in here. And then if um, your band needs risers or your DJ needs a, a table and a couple of chairs or any specific requirements, you can note that here. One of the really cool things too about this is your ability to add files in. So if you want to keep all of your contracts in one place, you can do that right here, hit files, and it will pull up the tool to, or the pop-up to add in from your computer. And then you're going to have it housed over here. So you can keep everything in one place. This is where you would add another contact that will pop up over here. But let's talk about this payment schedule because this is the feature that I think is going to be key in order to keep you on top of your budget. So we haven't gotten into the budget yet, but this is gonna be the first step in it. So if you are hiring a wedding planner, we already have a budgeted amount for them. We're gonna put in our invoice into this wedding planning category. So let's go ahead and enter that in. You're gonna see under this other information, things pop up here. And so we're gonna say that we had already budgeted, so it was already an amount that was within our budget. And again, we'll look at that feature in just a second. For coordination fees, let's just say the total is 2,000. And now if this was for a florist or a caterer or a rental company and the final count was based on what 
your final total was based on your guest count, you can select this just so you know it is a fluctuating number. Um, but most services for planners, photographers, those are usually pretty set fees. So if the total amount is going to be this $2,000, but we gave them 50% for a deposit, and we did that yesterday, we put that in, and that's going to show that the payment was made on the 19th, that's paid, or I'm sorry, that's the due date. If we paid it today, then it pops up here. Now, we're also going to want to put in when this remaining payment is going to be due, and let's say it's due the month before the wedding. So that would be the uh, December 1st, 2021. So this is going to auto fill this into where we saw those payments were. So it might not pop up here because we're still so far out, but you're gonna see the things that we've been doing are modifying this dashboard over here. We've made some progress in our planning. We've added more guests over here. And once those dates get closer, you're gonna see those pop up over here and payments when they're due as well. And of course, now we're working our way through our budget. So that's where you're gonna see that pop up over there. And then once we go back into our contacts, we're going to see this card is filled out in a little more detail. Obviously, if we had filled in the address and, and all those logistics and details, those would be here as well. But you're going to see the main payment details that pull up for each one of your vendors here. And you click on that and it takes you back in to this setting. So it's a great way to keep track of your vendors. You can see a quick overview of your vendors. Again, all of their contact information would fill in here. So if you wanna have a printout of your vendors once you get everybody all together, this is where you would do that. So that's your vendor tool. Again, it's gonna be a lot more comprehensive once you start adding more and more of your vendors in, and it's gonna be a great place to keep track of their contact information, payment information, and any other details that you wanna keep all in one place. Let's head over to the budget. The default for the budget is gonna be 30,000. That is just kind of like the national average. So that's why they put that in as the, um, as the default. But if you click on this, you're gonna have a pop-up and this is gonna be where you can adjust this. So I would recommend you start off with this. If you have not already done so, make sure you go through the budget bundle. I'm not gonna talk about the specifics of breaking down the budget here. Again, the budget bundle is where you're gonna find all of those details, but this is where you can track it all. So one of the coolest features about this software program in regards to the budget is, let's say you have a $20,000 budget. So we put that in there and obviously it shows, okay, we're automatically over budget. Well, do we have to go through each one of these items? You just auto adjust it and it breaks those down based on that 20,000 instead. Now let's go the opposite way and say we have 70,000 auto correct. and you're gonna see the same thing happens here. So it will adjust it for you, but that doesn't mean that your budget is done just because you entered this number and it filled these in. These are based on the algorithms of the averages for weddings, but again, go through that budget bundle because you're going to be able to pull up the number that is specific for you and your wedding and what your priorities are. I can't stress that enough that you can't just go based off of these numbers. You need to really dig in and know what the numbers mean so that you can reorganize things according to your preferences and priorities. So one big example is you may not have a catering cost. You may not have bar and beverage. All of that might be tied into your venue cost. If you're not having a, photo uh, a videographer, um, if you don't need any rentals or on the flip side, what if you need to bring in a tent and every plate and every fork? 
you're probably going to need to adjust the percentage that came up with this number significantly compared to somebody that doesn't have to bring all of those in. So that's why I say this is a good starting point, but you really do need to go through that budget bundle breakdown so that you can adjust these numbers accordingly. You can also sort these. So if you hover over here to the left, you can maybe you can move things up and down. So your venue, I like to organize it in um, order of biggest, biggest spender <laughs> down to the smaller numbers. So I typically will have the catering um, or venue, the bar costs, florals and rentals are usually pretty, uh, pretty expensive. I like to organize it that way. And then the costs that are smaller are, are further down the list, but you can do whatever you want. And then this is where you would alter that number. So let's say your venue is a pretty low cost venue. Um, maybe it's a thousand dollars to rent the space. Um, you're going to see that now when you adjust that, you've got this 2300 difference, but we also know that our catering is going to cost a lot more because we have a high guest count or whatever it might be. So we're going to adjust this to 9,000. Whoops, I keep clicking. You want to have this enabled and unlocked. Um, it's just a little quirk uh, that, that happens. So um, we adjusted this to 9,000 because we know that we've got a lot of people to feed or for whatever reason, this is going to be more significant. And we look down here and now the difference is in the red. So we need to find either where we're going to adjust for that. Maybe we don't need transportation. Um, maybe our favors and gifts are not going to be quite this pricey. Um, so that's where you play around with it and you can adjust it accordingly. You're going to see the only thing that's entered here right now is because we entered in the cost over in the contact feature. So this is what we entered in here. Now from the computer generated breakdown, it's showing that we're over in this amount. If this is a vendor that you absolutely know that you're going to book and that's what the cost is, then obviously we're going to change this. This is going to update us down here. Now we're $300 over our projected count. So we need to figure out where we're going to make those adjustments for within the budget. So remember, the budget is always moving. <laughs> it's a moving target. And it's all about being educated and just knowing where you are at with each component. So there's nothing wrong with being over temporarily. You just know, OK, we're going to have to cut somewhere else. Or if you're coming in over, you know that you're going to need to increase this overall number. As long as you're feeling educated and comfortable along the way, that is the most important thing when it comes to the budget. So this is the pop-up here that you are going to um, make those adjustments for. Let's go ahead because I don't like seeing those red numbers. We'll pretend we don't need transportation. That was $300. So it evens everything out. We're good to go. We're going to close out of here. This tracker is going to show you what has been entered or paid for because right now, again, we only have that one deposit. That's what it's showing here. But this will start to fill in as you move on with your planning. And then you can also track the vendors um, and how you're doing. And this is basically just a different way to view things throughout this budget here. So clicking on this budget, up at the top will bring this pop up and this is the overview and then this will show you how things are broken down more specifically as you start putting in more and more of your details next up is our notes section now over here is going to be where you're going to find all of my pre-loaded wedding planning tips templates and guides I'm not going to get into these in detail because this is reserved for our members. So if you are a member of Planning Collective, you are going to have access to all of these tools plus everything that I'm going to continue to add in. Um, basically, these are 
are tips or cheat sheets for you, things to help you with your wedding planning across the different categories. If you are not a member, you will still have a note section, but these will not be preloaded. So you won't have access to all of these guides and, um, and details unless you have your account through Planning Collective. But this note feature is still a great tool that you can use to keep things organized you can still kind of create your own for some of these documents that are in here. You can um, you can put together something specifically with your hotel room blocks. You can um, list the rentals you might need. Most commonly, I would say people put together a photography shot list, music lists, things like that. And in order to do that, what you're going to do, we'll scroll up to the top, um, you are going to add a new note. And then this will pop up here. You can title it and you can put it into a different category. And then here it's basically like a Word doc. So when you start editing it, you're going to have all of these details that come up. You can add images, links, all kinds of stuff. And this is how you would create your own note. So you can, um, you can again, be as, as detailed as you want. You can keep track of your own things in here. Um, if you're not a member, uh, again, it would just pop up. So I didn't give it a title. That's what it shows up there. If you are a member though, you're going to have access to all of these tools. Plus I have about seven or eight more to put in there today and more and more coming. So the notes feature is a great tool to use to help just kind of keep things organized. And of course, again, as a member, if you have any questions or if there is something that you have um, been stuck on or you have a question on, I would recommend you head over to this note section and you can probably find some answers in this spot. The next feature is the website feature that IELTS Planner has. If you don't already have a website going, I would highly recommend that you put a simple site together. It's going to really help you communicate with your guests and IELTS Planner has made it really easy. So again, there's a few other um, tools that are out there. If you're on the Knot or Wedding Wire or Zola, you may already have a site that is connected with the registry. Um, and that is fantastic. But if not, or if you don't want to get into any of that, you can definitely do that here. So you would just click create website. Um, you can give it whatever title you want. You can search to see what names are available. So there's already been a Pam and Jim, but you can mess around with it. Obviously, find something that's available for you. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to take up um, take up a domain name. You can add in images, tell your story, the story of how you became engaged, any details you want to talk about in regards to the wedding day. Um, and then you create your events page by selecting the little plus. And you're going to fill out the details for the event. If there's... Um, a hotel website or a venue website, you would enter that here, the location. And then same thing goes with travel info. It's going to be a pop-up here that you can fill in hotel uh, details in this area. If you want to add more photos so the guests can see photos of the two of you, this is a great tool because I find that a lot of family members, especially extended family, haven't had a chance to meet your significant other. And so it's it's always fun for them to see photos of the two of you together or maybe your groups of friends. Um, so I, I would recommend you put a few photos up there. And then here you can also add your registry information. You can add as many as you, you'd like, and then this will send them to the link of your registry. Um, so it, it's a simple site. Um, you can't do a ton of customizing. You would then publish it up here. So hit publish and then um, it will, you'll have a link here that will take you to that actual website. Again, it's, it's a simpler tool. <laughs> it's not anything too crazy, but if you don't want to get into any of those other tools, or if you're not good with web design, it is certainly a great feature to have that will help you to share the information with your guests and um, not have to spend hours and hours sorting through a whole bunch of other templates or details or anything like that. 
So this final menu item here is categories, and it's not really a full feature or tool on its own, but essentially this can help you with sorting through all of your planning tasks. Now, if you were to want to find everything that had to do with entertainment, you would select entertainment and it's going to pull up everything from your checklist. It's going to pull up the notes. You don't have any vendors right now tagged in entertainment, but it would pull those up, your contacts, um, anything that's tagged with entertainment, whether it's in the design studio or the timeline, it's all going to pull up here. So we entered some things for wedding planner. And because we entered that, you're going to see the contact information there. Here are all the notes that I have uploaded and tagged as wedding planners. Um, note sections here. So those are going to pull up plus any of the checklist items there. So not a feature or tool on its own, but an easy way if you want to just kind of sort through some different tasks and see what needs to be done in regards to a specific area. And once we've been playing around for a little bit, again, we'll head back over to this main screen and we'll see how some of these things have adjusted. You're going to have your countdown here. You'll see we've added some more guests to the list here. Um, as you get into sending out the invitations, you'll see the responses of who's coming and who is not. You'll be able to see where you're at within the planning process and what are the things that you have coming up in your planning that you need to have on your radar. So that is Aisle Planner. It is really such an amazing tool. I hope that you really enjoy getting into it. I know it's going to really help with your wedding plans. So I am always going to be adding more updates and changing some of the features around. Stay tuned for all of those details. Monthly, we're going to have a, a call that is specifically for Aisle Planner updates, troubleshooting, any questions that you have specifically dedicated to Aisle Planner. Uh, so stay tuned to the emails and the collective for those dates that are coming up. And of course, you can always find me with any questions that you have about it, either in my email or in our other member calls. Always open to helping you with those questions. So thank you so much for joining here and I will see you in the collective.